pushed all the buttons, all the technologic magic has begun, unless I'm not mistaken. If it looks like the live chat's up, if someone can let me know if you can see me and hear me okay. We've got a few more minutes till we get started. Looks like Susan and Amanda Joe are on the chat and moderating. Thank you, ladies. Much appreciated. So let me know if you can see and hear me okay. And then uh, we'll do a little shout out stuff. Rachel says, looks good, sweet. We're off to a good start. Hope everyone's having a good day, good morning, good evening, whatever the case may be. Uh, the weather from Southern Idaho, if you actually care, is it's chilly but clear the sun is just starting to come up and it's supposed to be a really nice day which is great news because I have a field trip later today with students and students are very finicky about the weather if the weather is really nice students will tend to buy into the learning process and be engaged and if they're cold or miserable or it's too hot or it's too windy or rainy or buggy or muggy um, then they kind of shut down so I picked a good day for the field trip. We'll do a few shout outs to folks. So uh, Amanda, Joe, and Susan, thanks again for help moderating. You guys are the true MVPs. And let me just scroll back a little bit here and say hi to a few folks. Uh, looks like we have Jack from Santa Monica, Danny from Tampa, Jan from Denver, um, a Brit in Northern Germany. Rebecca from a beach in North Carolina. That sounds nice. Uh, Michelle from Seymour, Indiana. Uh, Mama, Mama on Doggy from London, UK. Uh, Dordrecht in the Netherlands. Awesome. Uh, Hans Heinrich from Copenhagen, Denmark. Pete from Spain. Jeff from Aurora, Colorado. Patsy from Davison, Michigan, Joe from Redding, California, and David from Portland, Anna from Finland, Mark from Leamington, UK, Karen from Sebastian, Florida, very nice, Helen from Reykjavik, greetings, I think it's a clear day in Iceland as well based on what Amanda Joe told me at least in that part of Iceland. Um, let's see. David wants to tell me that any professor that would wear a midnight oil t-shirt on a live stream like I did the other day scores some serious bonus points. Sweet. Yeah. Happy to represent my favorite band, hands down. Um, wore it last night. There was a local high school basketball game and our friend's son plays on the team and it was a, a blackout. So everyone was supposed to wear a black t-shirt and that was the first one I grabbed. That was a no brainer for me. So thanks, David. Uh, Mary from Ellicott City, Maryland. Uh, let's see if we can give some other folks a shout out. We'll get started here in about seven minutes here, team. So hang in with me. If you're watching this on the recording, you can skip ahead. Or I try to put the little chapters in there so you can get right to the good stuff if that's what you want to. Sandrine from France. Uh, Jack McMichael from Santa Monica. I think I already mentioned him, but there you go, second one. Chris from Holland, Hazel from Belfast, uh, Ivana from Belgrade, Serbia. That's awesome. Oh, it skipped down again. Uh, I gotta scroll back up. Gary from Ridgecrest, Kelly from Australia, Lynn from Santa Barbara, Don from Los Angeles, Grandma Jay from West Virginia, Liz from Minnesota, Robert from Calgary, Sandy from Alabama. Melody from Hamburg, Germany. Uh, very good. John from near Lincoln, England. Miserable weather there. Sorry, John. Good old England. Uh, Mark from Phoenix. Mirren from Western Australia. Pone from Finland. Gabriel from Brazil. Virgil. Uh, didn't give a place there. That's okay. Robin from Buffalo. Nick from Malta. Renee from Kiel, Wisconsin. I think that's what that is. Beth Davidson 
Uh, I hope you're doing well, Beth. Thanks for the shout out. Janet from the UK, cold and rainy there. Yeah, if it's sunny somewhere, it's got to be rainy somewhere else, right? Uh, Steve from Grand Prairie, Texas. Uh, Jean from Inuvik in Arctic Canada. Wow, that sounds remote and exciting. Uh, Mule from Iceland. Hope I pronounced that right. Thank you. I probably didn't. I just realized. Uh, Soren from Denmark. Carolyn from New York City. Charlotte from the Peak District, UK. Adrian from the UK. UK is represented here, team. Like we've we've got a lot of folks from the UK here. Strong. Uh, Lauren from Oregon. Ake from Sweden. Awesome. Gabriel's here. Margaret's here from Atlanta. Vaughn from Dorset. Uh, Lorraine from Oroville, California. Ivana from Belgrade. I think I scrolled back up to where I was, and I gotta, I gotta scroll back down to where I wasn't. Um, Lynn, Santa Barbara, Kelly, Australia. Some of these I might have repeated. G. Perry, Mississippi. John, Des Moines. Jeannie from <clears throat> Virginia. Excuse me. John Patrick from Munich. Keeley from the UK. Lorna from Bryan, Texas. Dirk from the Canary Islands. Gosh, that's high on my bucket list. Love to go there sometime. Uh, Sally from Leeds. Lauren from Portland. Or David from Lauren, Portland. It's, let's see. Susan from Boise. Lenina from the Netherlands. Linda from Seattle. Michelle from Snowflake, Arizona. Oh my gosh. The Mogollon Rim. Northern Arizona. Uh, Fred's, Fred from Spain, Jill from Tampa, Jackie from the Dalles, Oregon, Chris from the very wet, soggy UK, uh, Rock Tapper Robin from Yorkshire, UK, Andy from Nottingham, Jay from Virginia, Francine from BC, Canada, John from Marshall, Illinois, and the list goes on and on. Jeffrey, Netherlands, Larry DeMarch, from the bottom of post-glacial Lake Agassiz. Uh, Jake, have you found any pattern in the Iceland eruptions? Um, if you want to make sure you, if you have questions for me for the end, those will be handled by our moderators, Amanda Joe, which goes by, who goes by Mandy Joe on the live chat, and Susan. And so they'll put instructions there for how you can send those through. Trevor from Liverpool, John from Medea, Pennsylvania, Forrest from Greece, Nomad from Mount Doom, Middle Earth. Wow, all the way from a, a Tolkien book right to the live chat. That's quite the, quite the pipeline. Uh, Stephen from Belfast, I got you, bud. Sorry, the live chat moves and then I lo it it loses my place and then I have to scroll up and figure it all out. Uh, Jay Bollinger from Boston and Umphrey, how are you? Ian from Portsmouth, thank you, appreciate it. Brian from Ontario, Laura from Simi Valley, Paul from Newfoundland, Lyle Washington, Yevin from the Highlands of Scotland, I love Scotland, Anel Ingberg from Sweden, Sally Safi19 from Stirlingshire, Scotland, Bruce from UK, where it's very rainy apparently, uh, Wolf Schleiss from Jerome, Idaho, just up the road. You could be sitting on my couch right here next to me. You're close enough. That's just like a couple miles away. Scott from Bellingham, Washington. GTZ from Germany. Terry from Bainbridge Island. Kitty, let's see, Kitty City Kevin from Clemson. Kathy from Scotland. And, I, boy, I'm... I'm I'm losing the battle, but that's great. That means we're growing as a community, right? If there's more people on the live chat, then I can give a proper shout out, which is going to happen. That just means we're doing well collectively. So thank you for joining me. Uh, we got like less than a minute to go. So I'll give a couple more here, just random. Rob from Derbyshire, England. Joe Benny in Scotland, where it's sunny. Zez from Finland. Uh, David K. hello. Michael from OKC, Susan from Browns Point, Washington, uh, Dan Dennis from Oshkosh, Wisconsin, William from Round Top, Texas, uh, 
and then I think I'm almost caught up. Now I'm a few minutes behind. Marty from Perth, Australia. Julia from Stourbridge, UK. And Lee from Australia. And I'm running out of running out of time again. Paul from Vancouver, Washington. We could just do this for hours, right? Just people and places. Um, yeah, it'd be cool if we. It'd be cool if there was like a map of the world and as you logged on like a little dot populated or something like that. I'm sure someone can figure out that out. That would be kind of a neat little touch to see at some point. Okay, Mark from Puerto Vallarta, Nita from Atlanta, and lots of other good folks here. So, excuse me. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started though here team. So thank you all for joining me. Welcome to this live stream on a Thursday, Thursday morning for me. Uh, these Thursday morning live streams, I know I did one last week, but they are a little bit rare because my normal schedule is I have geology labs to teach starting at eight o'clock. But last week um, I had scheduled not to have labs that day because I was leaving town and the students get that time back later in the semester when we're gone on all day field trips. Today, I usually have my 101 lab starting right now but they have a field trip later this afternoon at 2 p.m. So I have this little window of time open and so it worked out well for me to do the live stream. I do have a Geology 102 lab that I need to be in class for at 11 a.m. So we definitely won't be going uh, three hours on this live stream, which is probably good news for everyone. So we'll definitely wanna cut this off at uh, around the two hour mark or so. I can go a little bit further. We'll just see how it goes with the, with the Q&A. But thanks again for joining me. Appreciate uh, the great geolo geologic educational committee, committee, community that we've built here together. Thanks for everyone for your support, for your encouragement, the emails, everything you do to help me uh, promote geology education. I hope that you realize how passionate I am about what I do. Um, I truly just love geology and I love sharing with people. I think sharing is a, a natural human impulse when we have something good and something of value in our lives. We want to share it with other people. And so hopefully it comes across that way. The plan for today is that we're going to um, do a little debrief on my trip this past weekend to Bryce Canyon National Park. I'll show you a couple photos. I'll also give you a couple of teasers on a few videos that will be coming uh, through the pipeline soon. I have a few announcements in the way of this channel that we'll go over, including an exciting one that will, the, the event will happen tomorrow, but um, I'm actually going to record it. So there's an exciting thing happening tomorrow, then another fairly exciting event happening later uh, in the beginning of March. And then we'll do our, the beef of our program this morning will be an update on the latest happenings in Iceland. I think it's been since, when was my last? Update. I guess it was been a week, yeah, because I was gone over the weekend. Um, so it's been a week since we've discussed the ongoing situation in Iceland. Amanda Joe, as always, has provided me with lots of great information, some news stories, made me aware of what's happening, and most importantly, uh, relayed to me some of the uh, feelings, attitudes, and happenings uh, for the residents of uh, Grindavik. And so we'll we'll definitely discuss that. And then we'll wrap up with some question and answer as much as I can get to. Uh, if it if there's too many too many questions that I can handle this morning, I'll make sure I keep those and then we'll circle back at some point and I will make sure I, I address those in a future broadcast. But um, the live chat is where you want to put your questions and Susan or uh, Amanda Joe will put the format there. Actually, it looks like they've got it automated. The Nightbot is sort of our automated monitor, moderator on the live chat. And so there's instructions there for how you can get a question to me. Because if you just type it in in the live chat, it probably won't get picked up because there's just so much volume there. So make sure you precede your question with a big, large, looks like a red question mark. And so they can see those, pick those out, and they'll aggregate those and then email those to me. So. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so as many of you know, this past weekend, uh, I went on a trip to Bryce Canyon National Park and we have a group of friends. So there's me on the right, there's my wife, Erica on the left and two other couples that are our dear friends. We try to do a cross country ski trip every year. And last year we went into Yellowstone and that was awesome and memorable. And I did make a few videos during that trip. 
this trip we thought it would be neat to ski through the landscape of Bryce Canyon in the winter. Uh, and so it was really awesome trip. And this is some of the scenery from that trip. We had great weather. It was sunny and, you know, given that it was winter, relatively warm. Bryce Canyon, even though it sits in southern Utah, lies at about eight to 9,000 feet in elevation. Uh, for our metric friends, that's maybe uh, 2,400 to 2,600 meters, somewhere around there. So it, it's quite high elevation. And so they do get an appreciable amount of snow up on this plateau. It's called the Ponzagate Plateau, part of the greater Colorado Plateau area that encompasses much of southern Utah and northern Arizona. It's an area known for these flat, mostly flat-lying, horizontally bedded sedimentary rocks. So the rocks you're seeing there, these beautiful pink and white and reddish rocks. This is a unit called the Claron Formation. It's actually lake deposits from a big freshwater lake. And I did a whole video that should come out soon while I was down there that looks at some of these rocks and how these rocks form these very impressive little pinnacles and spires and hoodoos. That plateau way out there in the distance is um, the Aquarius Plateau and that rises up over 10,000 feet in elevation which would be uh, what over 3,000 um, meters in elevation. Pretty impressive. So just some of the nice scenery there. Um, there's a picture of me on my skis, not going down that hill obviously, but this is us skiing along the rim there. Um, wonderful ecosystem of ponderosa pines and junipers and pinyon pines. There's also some aspen trees and groves and places, uh, and probably some other trees I'm not familiar with as well. Um, this is a picture a friend took of me. I, I when we took a break from skiing, I wanted to get down closer to some of the hoodoos, so I scrambled down this snowy trail that wasn't packed. And this is me kind of looking over my notes and my my script as I'm getting ready to do one of my videos. So my, my buddy took a picture of this. So there's a little, little behind the scenes photo uh, of me getting ready. So when you see the video, you might notice this little stump in front of me that I use as a, as a desk for some of my diagrams and such. Um, pretty cool. Here's just some more of the scenery here. This was actually from the place I took the, I made the video. You can see some of these just incredible uh, spires and hoodoos. Uh, the, I don't even know if the photo does it justice. It was just, it was really nice. It was just a, a really fun outing and a fun weekend. So this is parts of Bryce Canyon in the winter time. Great place. If you haven't been, um, you, Southern Utah has five national parks. Arches, Canyonlands, Capitol Reef, Zion, and Bryce. Bryce Canyon sits pretty close to Zion. You could probably visit both of them. You could visit both the same day, but you'd only be spending uh, a few hours at each site. They're, they're like maybe an hour, hour and a half away from each other. So great place to visit. Um, so we skied mostly the first day. And there's my wife and I. Um, that's looking again back out to the east there. So we skied around. Um, we did maybe like I think that first day about five or six miles on our loop. And then the next day uh, I got up early and my friend wanted to come with me. Even though I normally do these videos completely alone, it kind of makes me a little more self-conscious when someone's kind of watching me. But he thinks it's great fun. And so he uh, took a picture of me while I was making uh, one of these videos. So this is a random road cut. So if that looks like an intriguing road cut to you random road cut fans out there, look for this one soon. Uh, this is the road that goes from Tropic, the little town we were in just below Bryce Canyon National Park. There's a road that goes from Tropic down to Cannonville. And then from Cannonville, there's a road that goes over to Kodachrome Basin State Park. And then you can take a gravel road south of there. It's called Cottonwood Canyon Road. And that will get you down um, a beautiful drive right through a monocline. I mean, fantastic geology. It closed this time of year, though, probably for the snow. But that will get you down to Highway 89 between Kanab and Page, right along the Utah-Arizona border. So this is one of the road cuts I had um, decided to stop at. Um, so I'll just kind of let the, the photo of the road cut just sit there as a teaser. I don't want to explain too much and steal my own thunder from a future video. This is looking, if you just turn around from where I just was and look at the opposite side of the road cut, that's the other side of the road cut. There's a few interesting things going on there that I'll explain in the video. Um, so there's that little thing. And then 
my buddy and I, everyone was still kind of waking up at the house. It was early in the morning. I said, hey, let's go do, you feel up to doing one more video? And he said, heck yeah, that'd be great. So we drove to the north end of Bryce Canyon National Park. And just above Highway 12 there, there's this kind of ominous looking overhanging cliff that protrudes out uh, in several places, kind of running east-west along here. And again, this is where I did another video, so I don't want to give away too many secrets. Uh, but I'll put, a, I'll put a big fat arrow on here to show you kind of what's going on. Um, and I'll just let that kind of sit and simmer. It goes against all my instincts because I, I, I want to just jump in and tell you because I'm obviously a sharer. Um, but I'm going to let the video speak for itself. This is a cool structural feature that you might have figured out right now, but it actually has an interesting origin. It doesn't, it doesn't have the orientation of most structures like this in Utah, and it has a different origin or mechanism as opposed to other structures that might be somewhat similar. So I'll let that kind of sit there. Some of you who maybe know the geology of this area, you might, you might have figured it out. Um, but that was another place we went to. And then the second full day we had there, um, we didn't know at the time, but some of the trails were actually open down into the amphitheater. Bryce Canyon is a bit of a misnomer. There's not actually a canyon. It's really an eroded rim of the plateau, if you kind of look up there towards the skyline. Um, and so, and, and then it's eroded into these, these lake deposits, uh, just these fantastic shapes and textures in the rock. So it's not really a canyon there, but some of the trails were open around the Bryce Amphitheater area. And so we just had our, either our snow boots or our hiking shoes on and our poles, and that worked out just fine. So there's part of our group hiking down into, and this was a loop, I think this was the, through Queens Garden. I can't re remember what trail we were on. We started at Sunrise Point and we ended at Sunset Point. So, but just beautiful weather, just perfect conditions, blue skies. Um, just perfect temperature. Uh, this feature here to the left with this pinnacle with the big gray kind of square rock sitting on top, this is known as Thor's Hammer. So it's one of the more scenic and often photographed places in the park. This is also looking to the east. <clears throat> um, there is a couple natural bridges in Bryce Canyon. National Parks. Actually, this is a double bridge. There's a lower one down here and a higher one here. Uh, the geology here is there's a bed of limestone that's a little bit more resistant. Um, and so as this gully has been eroded by flash floods and rainwater, um, it was flowing over this for a while, but then it started to undercut the softer rock below this this uh, bed of harder limestone. And then eventually, as it just kept cutting down through the softer material, it left this as a bridge supported between the two walls there. And then there's a second one down here, which is pretty cool. So very cool. And then this is just another scenic view, just these little narrow gullies. You can see some people way down there at the very bottom of the frame. Uh, the big, uh, these are mostly, I think, ponderosa pines that live in these sort of micro kind of climate habitats. You know, you got the two walls here, so it stays a little more shaded throughout the year. A lot of moisture gets funneled into these things, and so some of the trees can grow. Uh, protected by the wind, they can be quite tall. Uh, let's see, a couple more pictures. Um, oh, this was kind of fun. So I'm a terrible photographer, but hopefully this helps. You can see the people at the bottom hiking up the hill in our group, and they're a little bit blurry. But what's focused here is this overhanging panel of rock that was hanging above the trail. And what you might be able to pick out, because I've had several videos that focus on this feature is what we have is a a face of rock with some polished uh, there's some polished surfaces and some striations there's some definite lines running more or less up and down this rock face here and if you know what these are these are slicken lines so this is part of a fault surface where the rocks moved past each other during some probably small earthquake event, doesn't have to be a big earthquake, and that frictional movement along the fault as the rocks are grinding past each other polishes the surfaces of the rock and leaves these striations here. Yep, so these are slicken lines, uh, all, one, all one word. So these are called slicken lines. There you go, I just helped out on the chat. So, 
silicon lines. And then the surface that they occur on, which is often the fault plane, but sometimes you can call the surface that they're on silicon sides. So again, all one word. So there you go, something kind of fun. There's the, there's the application, right? You, hopefully we learn something from maybe one of my videos. And then when you see it in some other location uh, with different context, uh, it's pretty cool to be able to decipher what's going on there. So small little fault surface there, right, right above the trail, right above your head there as you're hiking this trail in Bryce Canyon. Uh, one more view as we're hiking out, there's Thor's hammer. Uh, I don't know if this one has a name, but you can see th these other three similar uh, spires or pinnacles over here with a little bit harder cap rock on top. Uh, the little more, the more gray the limestone generally at Bryce Canyon, the, the more resistant it is. These limestones are a little bit muddy. That's why they have <clears throat> a lot of this reddish color to them. They look a little different than some of your normal limestones, but they are true limestones. And what's interesting about them is they're freshwater limestones. So this formed from a large freshwater lake and I obviously will explain the whole thing and show you some maps and such with the video that I should have out um, probably this weekend I would guess and then uh, on our way home so we had about a seven hour drive ahead of us um, from Bryce Canyon to go all the way back to Idaho uh, but our good friends were kind enough to let me uh, pull the car over and I said give me 15 minutes here's a random road cut and so this is on Highway 20, which is between Interstate 15 and Highway 89, just uh, west of Panguitch, Utah, if you're familiar with that town. And so I did uh, another random road cut video along this little section here. You can see some different layers, light and dark. You might be able to pick out some other features there. Pretty interesting road cut. Um, the cars were whizzing by as they always are, but did the best I could there. Uh, and then we went on our merry way and drove home. So, so yeah, so that's the, so that was my weekend. That's a little recap on my last little trip. Hopefully you like these little slideshows. If nothing else, it gives you something to look forward to with some more videos coming down the pipe, or um, it's just an opportunity for me to share, maybe inspire you to visit some of these places, or maybe it's a place <clears throat> that you won't be able to get to anytime soon. And so it gives you a little bit of insight into those. So, um, yeah, you never know how, you know, a slideshow from someone else will land with others, but hopefully those are of interest for you guys. So, uh, moving on to our announcements. So, uh, one big announcement, I've got, I guess, a couple big ones here. One is that tomorrow, on Friday, I have arranged, finally, it's booked, the Zoom invite has been sent, the Zoom invite has been accepted, that I will be having a chat with the Icelandic professor, uh, Thorvaldur Thordarsson from the University of Iceland. A lot of you may have seen him or in some of the news articles from Iceland. He's been on numerous videos. He, he's a very prominent volcanologist, not just in Iceland, but in other areas. He's written several, at least one I can think of, and maybe more than one, uh, book on Icelandic geology. So I'm really excited to talk with him. Um, I have some questions ready. I need to get more ready. Um, and so we'll just have a conversation. I'm a little nervous because I've done you know, a lot of these videos and here I am live streaming, but I really haven't done a whole lot with another geologist or scientist. And so I thought for this first interview, I didn't want to have the, um, I didn't want to have the live stream going at the same time and have to juggle all those things at once. And so this will just be a recorded interview. And then as soon as he and I wrap up, I will get that up and post that. So look for that tomorrow. We're interviewing tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. my time, which is 5 p.m. in Iceland. Um, so if you're in Europe, you might see that get posted uh, sometime in the evening before you go to bed. If you're elsewhere, you might just wake up in the morning and, and there it is on YouTube. If you're here in the States, you can look for it sometime that afternoon. But I'm really excited to just talk to him, ask him some questions, talk about the volcanism in the Reykjanes Peninsula. It should be pretty awesome. So, um, and thank you to the, <clears throat> I should give the proper shout out because I mentioned on other episodes how, you know, I, <clears throat> I saw a news article with him and I wondered where he was coming to these conclusions and had questions and one of the viewers and I can't remember your name I apologize said why don't you just 
like get a hold of him and ask him and, and in the moment I thought that's a really good idea like maybe I should just see I think in the back of my mind it's like oh he's a prominent Icelandic geologist what does he want to you know he's not going to have time to talk with some guy in Idaho he's probably never met before um, but he re he was very um, gracious with his time and was happy and eager to to talk it over and so we had we went back and forth on scheduling a little bit but <clears throat> it's confirmed now that should be happening uh, tomorrow morning and then just look for that video so as soon as I as we wrap up if I need to do a little bit of editing you know on the ends I'll do that uh, but I'll probably put it together in its entirety and then and then go ahead and get that posted for you guys to enjoy that so hopefully that will be uh, fun. Yeah, and someone said, don't be nervous on the live chat. Uh, I'm already nervous thinking about it. I've, I don't think, I, have, I mean, I guess I've never really done like a formal interview with someone, so I'm not too nervous. I mean, I want it to be more of an organic conversation, a back and forth between two colleagues. Um, I think it'll go well. I'm not, I'm not too nervous. It'll be great. So um uh, keeping my expectations low and then hopefully those will be exceeded uh, the second thing on here and maybe I'll, I'll click on it and show you guys this but the um, let's see that's not gonna work let's try it a different way um, our good friends at Nature Eye put together a documentary over the last few weeks let me just open this in a different window and they had me be a part of that which was really nice they were mainly focusing all this fun activity that had taken place um, in Iceland sorry I'm trying to open up this window here we go so I'm not gonna have you watch all of this you can watch this on your own but I just want to give you a little a little taste of it um, so they did this in-house this isn't like a big theatrical release or anything this is just something that nature I wanted to do to market and just let people know some of the cool stuff they were doing um, but what's great about it is they've got some great footage obviously and they have little interview snippets it's really well done with so there's Johan so our, our drone pilot that I was talking to at many times during some of our flights so they talk with him um, and then they talk to me at some point here which is pretty cool that's Gary so he's the the CEO I think of the company and he was actually in Iceland with Johan when some of this took place they talk with me that's exciting um, yeah and they just kind of recap that that exciting I guess month or so period in December and January when we had uh, all that action going on so that's like a seven minute video and it's out there for you guys. I'll make sure there's a link in the video description or I guess you can go to the Nature Eye YouTube site and catch it there as well. So anyway, just wanted to make you aware of that. That's pretty cool. Um, and just also remind you if you're interested because they are such a great partner for me um, and the things we're doing here for us collectively as a team uh, that if you want to do a flight of your own, it doesn't have to be in Iceland. They have several locations throughout the world. Um, there's places in Africa, there's one in Washington, um, they've got, there's one in Peru near Machu Picchu, I think, on the, near the Inca Trail. You can go on there, you can book a flight, and if you use the code SEANFLY, uh, you get $10 off your flight. And so that can be a fun experience for you, or if you want to give it as a gift to someone else, um, that'd be a great idea. They did get with me uh, today, they're, they're working on, so most of you are probably asking, well, when are we going to see you fly the drone around the next eruption or some something in Iceland? And they're working on getting some of that figured out. Johan lives in northern Iceland, so it's not as easy as him just like, you know, oh, it's erupting. I'll just, you know, be there in half an hour. It's a bigger, bigger deal for him to get down there um, and have the the drone ready to go. But they are working on some of that. So I don't know if we'll. It, I don't know when the next time we'll be able to do that is, but they're working on it. And in the meantime, they did ask me, I, I heard from one of the dro or, uh, Nature Eye uh, uh, folks today, and he offered to have me do a flight around Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe in Africa. 
Um, and there's some pretty interesting geology there. I'll have to learn a lot of it as I go, but that might be interesting. So that might happen in the next couple of weeks as well, as we're also waiting for things to happen in Iceland. And then my final announcement here, team, is that uh, Nick Zentner, who many of you know, who's a very prominent and prolific American geologist here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, does all sorts of great things on his YouTube channel with uh, looking at Ice Age floods and geology of the Pacific Northwest. Some of you might remember I was on his YouTube channel. Apparently that's called a collab in the business. I just learned that last month or so. Um, but I was on his channel a few weeks ago and to reciprocate, he's agreed to come on mine. So I guess that'll be kind of like my second interview. So I'll, I'll break the ice with Professor uh, Thorlerson and then we'll jump in with Nick Zentner. And he and I are gonna have a discussion um, I think I want to talk about just public outreach and how science is conveyed and some of the barriers that exist, unfortunately, between the public and science in general. I think I want to have kind of a broad discussion with him and just see where it goes. But that'll be a, that will be a live stream and that'll be on March 3rd uh, at 10 a.m. Mountain Time, 5 p.m. UTC. So so there's some fun things to look forward to coming down the pipe in addition to just some of the regular videos that I put out for you. Uh, Iceland updates, Kilauea updates, and then also just my field-based videos, which um, I put out quite often. Uh, okay, so, oh, and then one last thing on announcements um, are the field trips. And so many of you have gotten a hold of me regarding these. I probably have room with this April 12th and 13th field trip and you can pick either day so if you can't go both days that's okay you can choose either day probably room for about 14 or so more people you can email me for those details if you'd like and when I say room that means that these other people have already booked and, and confirmed the Iceland one of course is filled and then I have three different field trips that I explained in the last live stream last week so you can look to that if you want to know where we're going um, Craters of the Moon, City of Rocks, and another cool area north of Twin Falls called Black Magic Canyon. Those will be in June, and I've got room. That's that's a little less than half full. This one's about half-ish full. Uh, and then there'll be some other ones coming down the pipe, too. I just don't have those planned out yet. So, um, so let me know if you're interested in those. Would love to see you out there uh, learning in the field with me. Okay, let's get to our Iceland update. Um, and let's start with the Met Office uh, update. Now, this is the most recent one. Uh, it was a few days ago, February 19th. So I think, I think now, I think the general vibe I have is that now that we've gone through several cycles of these inflation, eruption, uh, and then reinflation events, um, it's not as new. It's not as novel the danger's still there, there's still the risk, but um, you know, it's something, it's more, it's becoming, it feels like it's becoming more routine-like. And so I wonder if that's why maybe we see less information on, in, not just in the news in Iceland, but also from the Met Office. So, and I'm sure if any big data had occurred or anything had come across the, the wires, they would, they would update us. But at any rate, here's, here's what we have so far. So, uh, continued magma accumulation. Again, this is from uh, the 19th, which was uh, Monday. Um, the main thing here is that they put out a new hazard map, which is small right now, but I'll show you a big version of that here in a second. Um, and now, and we'll also get to this later too, they are letting the residents of Grindavik back into town 24-7, so people who want to can stay there overnight. Of course, there's still some infrastructure that's not completely in place. And I will get to that once we get through some of the science stuff here in a bit. But the main difference on the hazard map was they added a, a new zone, zone seven, um, because there's cracks over in this area. So recognizing that this was the route people now need to take to get into town is they've got to come in on this road from the west to get into town because the lava flow covered some of these other roads here. Um, they wanted to put this hazard zone on the map just because some of these fractures and cracks that exist in that area. So um, yeah, so that's where we are with the Met Office. When we look at seismicity over the last 24 hours, it's very quiet. It's, it's really quiet. I mean, there is just not a lot of earthquake activity happening on the Reykjanes Peninsula 
over the last couple of days. It's been very slow. The few earthquakes that we see there are very low in magnitude. They're ones or below generally. There's a 0.5. Uh, just not a lot going on. And not just in the area north of uh, Grindavik, but out here near uh, Fagardalsfjallt and the Krišuvik system and some of these other systems to the east. Just it's quiet. There's a little cluster happening over here near um, I guess that's Hengil, that area, but again, very small earthquakes, 0.8. These are all less than ones, um, and they are mostly uh, just like looks like random depths, two to six kilometers, um, but nothing alarming, right? Like 10, 10, 12 small earthquakes in a 24 hour period. Um, in my mind, that's not really a swarm, that's just a, a very small cluster. So there's the earthquake data just sort of spatially on a map. Uh, when we look at the Met Office graph that shows earthquakes over time, uh, this shows the last 48 hours of earthquakes. You can see there was only one that was above a two on the whole peninsula, uh, and the rest were all smaller, and you can see it's pretty quiet. And the weather's been pretty decent there the last couple of days, so this, is, this should be pretty true, uh, accurate data. Just this isn't uh, lulls in the data caused by weather disruptions with the instruments. This is true earthquake activity. So just, you know, there's a little cluster there, small little cluster, but it's just been pretty quiet throughout um, in terms of earthquakes. And if you remember last update, we had a great animated map that was put together by one of our awesome teammates, Bruce Garner, and that showed earthquake activity in different parts of the Reykjanes Peninsula uh, over different periods of time. And another of our teammates here, let me get his name right, he's from Poland, his name is Jan Marluski, and I hope I pronounced that right. He has a, another um, animation, similar type of animation, that goes from 2009 all the way to today. And I actually want to show this in its entirety. It's only about three minutes long, but it further illustrates what, what I think I was trying to convey with Bruce's maps, and that is, are we having increased earthquake activity on the Reykjanes Peninsula? You could argue yes, because we're also getting volcanic eruptions, and volcanic eruptions carry with them increased and enhanced seismicity. Um, but, we all, but we've always had, I mean, always being at least 2009, we, we've had earthquakes occurring on this peninsula in clusters along these known volcanic or tectonic trends or systems that you know trend northeast southwest like the the Svartsengi area and the Fagardalsfjallt area and the Krišuvik system over here um, those have kind of gone on over time so I'm going to let this play I might pause it every now and then to show to maybe illustrate a few points um, but I want to I want you to see what this peninsula has been doing in terms of earthquake activity over the last, um, I guess, what is this, 15 years. So we're going to look at 15 years of earthquakes in about three minutes. Um, to give you some reference, uh, Jan's done a good job of showing you right at the beginning that a little tiny dot of that size is a magnitude one earthquake. And if you see something of that size, that's a two, a three, a four, and a five. So he's showing you with these circles um, the different magnitudes of quakes. And the way he's got the data here is you'll see it's always a Thursday. So basically every Thursday um, it's aggregating all the earthquakes over the past week and then showing those and then Jan has just um, uh, animated those over time. So we're going to start January 1st 2009. Okay these will kind of come fast and furious but we'll pause them when we can. So now we're already in February, right? So just let some of this digest, and then occasionally I may pause or back it up. So, I mean, right there, if we go back just to Skosh there, it's hard to pause right where you want it. So here's June 11, 2009. So the area just northeast of Grindavik, big earthquake swarm, another big swarm over here near, near the Krišuvik system. And yet, was there any eruptions in 2009? No. Okay, these were tectonic quakes. Um, and I think the point I'm really trying to drive home is that, and I'm going to ask the professor this too and see what his opinion is, but to me, because this is the plate boundary, the tectonic activity 
is the driver. The tectonic activity is the controlling um, mechanism or force, if you will, that's controlling earthquake activity for the most part, and to some degree, and to a large degree, I would say, controlling the volcanic activity as well. So, so there we are, 2009. I got to let this go a little bit. So, but you know, you can see there's periods, you know, where it's kind of slow. You know, if we pause in the right spot on this week, it was pretty slow, right? A little bit offshore. Um, and then there's other periods where things really ramp up. There's a really slow week, right? That might look like this past week that we had uh, on the Reykjanes Peninsula. So we're into 2010 now. Just not much activity happening. Just a few little quakes here and there. And then, you know, good swarm here near the, in the Krishavik system. A lot happening there. So, you know, had you know, been around in 2011, I wasn't following any of this in 2011. Maybe you were. Um, but anyone following this day in and day out like we are now, if you go back in time and look at it with the same mindset you have now, it would be easy to maybe jump to some of the conclusions that we that some of us have collectively about, about what's going on currently if we went back in time and looked at it with that kind of mindset. Um, that's the point I'm trying to make. But because it hadn't erupted yet in 2011, probably I would guess no one was thinking eruption. They were just like, ah, another earthquake, because there hadn't been an eruption there for hundreds of years. So we'll let this go a little further. Ooh, big swarm there. We're still in 2011 in the summertime. There was some little quakes around Grindavik there. 2012 now. Okay, and so all the places we've seen earthquakes happening over the past three months that people have brought to my attention and maybe yours, including the offshore areas out here by LD, um, the Grindavik area, Fagodalsfjallt, Krishavik, over here in these systems southeast of the capital area, they're all they're all likely players, right? They're not these are not surprising areas to get earthquakes, and sometimes you just get a few tiny ones. And other times you get bigger, more frequent clusters of quakes. Like, look at that one right there. Let's go back a bit on that one. Uh, where was it? Boom, right there. October 17th, 2013. Holy cow. I mean, that's a five right there, right at the southwest tip of the peninsula with a few little ones around uh, Grindavik in this area. Like, alarming, right? And had we gone back in time, how many people you know, maybe myself included, I'm not saying I'm immune from this, but how many people might have thought, oh my gosh, it's about to erupt because of these earthquake swarms. Um, what we didn't see at that time, as far as I know, what would be cool to see alongside this, or at the same time, if you could, would be ground deformation, right? So what we're learning here is earthquakes are a very important monitoring component of volcanic activity. But earthquakes in and of themselves don't necessarily portend a volcanic eruption. You can have earthquakes, especially in this sort of system, that have nothing to do with magma moving in the subsurface, which is very different than some places like Hawaii, where most earthquakes are accompanied by that. Um, and I think that's the biggest point I'm trying to make here, and I hope I'm expressing that well. Uh, so we'll let this move a little forward. I've kind of blabbed my way through only one minute of it. So now we're into 2014. Most weeks, very few earthquakes. No one's feeling these quakes. Eh, but there's a three, two or three or four every now and then. Okay, so you can see now we're into 2015. And you can just see these little clusters form and come and go. You know, one area is releasing pressure, so you get a little swarm of quakes. And a lot of these are probably, you know, like a bigger earthquake, like this one here, and then the associated aftershocks. Okay, so these aren't taking place simultaneously. This is a week's worth of data. So this is seven days of data. That's how many earthquakes you had in that area. Now, will, as we get closer to 2020, will there be more earthquakes that show up on here? Absolutely, because when we get to 2020, or 2021, I suppose, there was a big cluster right there, 2017. And look where that one was. That was right, is that the one I was looking at? Yeah, right there there build it up oh no I missed it right there just that's the Fagradelsfjallt system right just east of northeast of Grindavik um, but as we get to 2021 and the eruptions are happening do I expect these 
swarms and circles on this graph that Jan put together to be more prolific? Of course I do, because now we're having, now we're adding to the tectonic component, magma pushing to the surface and breaking rock. So now I'm getting the co combined effect of tectonic quakes and volcanic quakes. And so I expect this to be much more prolific, there to be more numerous earthquakes on the map. So here we are, 2017. And this is on Jan's, I should mention this, he, he has a, a YouTube channel as well, and this is, this is on his uh, YouTube channel. So you can go in there and give him a shout out or check this out more on your own. So thanks again to Jan for doing this and, and also for letting me share it. I really appreciate it. So here are 2018, okay? About 2019, okay? Four years, five years ago. Now, in late 2019 is when things started to ramp up. So you, we will see a change in earthquake frequency and overall behavior as we get late into 2019 and 2020. Remember our first eruption though, the first eruption in this area is March, 2021. So here's August, September, October. So there was a big cluster there, January, 2020, okay right there. I guess that was 2019, December. Big one there. That's pretty interesting. So right around, you can't even see Grindavik, right? It's just gone. That's the Svartsengi area, 2020. And that's about when they started suspecting and measuring ground deformation. So this, this is about the time we confirm that magma is moving upwards. Everything preceding that was tectonic quakes. It's it's faults and fractures moving, but if they're moving, um, my light went out again. If they're moving uh, laterally or opening, then we're creating space for that magma to come through. So the tectonic activity is creating the conditions where the magma can then reoccupy the area. So here are 2020, a bunch. Now, now it's like almost like three systems, right? You've got like this area around Grindavik, uh, the tip of the peninsula, and then this offshore area out by LD 2020. Um, now, <clears throat> now what we should see, because we know the eruption in 2021 is right in here at the Fagradalsfjall area, so we should see everything kind of shift back that way. We'll see if that plays out. Yeah, now it's shifting back to the east. Now we're November 2020. That was a big, big week right there. Boom. Uh, so that's I guess that's magnitude five. That's a big quake right there and probably associated aftershocks. So that's October, 2020. Then we get into 2021. Okay, boom, right there. So there's late February. Um, and I don't know, I don't have the data in front of me, but I would, I would assume that as that eruption got closer, not only did we see the increased earthquake activity, but there was ground deformation uh, data as well that supported that. And then boom, there's that's there's an eruption right there. So just <laughs> lots of big circles. This is magma finally making its way to the surface, breaking through. And then you'll see this quickly die down um, because as we go into 2021, it's still erupting. That volcano is still erupting at the Fagradalsfjall area all through the summer. Tourists are hiking in at this point and just captivated by this very tourist friendly fast fantastic eruption but the earthquake activity dies back down because the conduit and the um, pathway for the magma to the surface has been established now we get into september that eruption that lasted about six months starts to die down so no eruptions at the end of 2021 but we still have these little earthquakes popping off tectonic quakes um, there's a big little swarm there but no eruption uh, let's see, where was that one at? Yeah, right there around Christmas time, 2021, but no eruption at that time. Now we're into 2022, and our eruption here is going to be in August, right there. So I might have missed it by one week. It was, and I remember this well because um, as soon as I saw that the eruption had begun, I bought a ticket that day, and I was there within a week which was a good thing because that eruption only lasted about three weeks. So I got there, I got to see the eruption in its spectacular glory, and then um, it died down pretty quickly. So there's an eruption, eruptive event there. And then we, now it's, now that eruption's over. We're into 2022, now we're into 2023. 
okay March 2023 basically a year ago right and there's the earthquake activity maybe not much unlike what we saw this past week in Iceland uh, and then as we get towards summer of 2023 that's going to er result in a third eruption a little bit further to the north in that uh, Fagradalsfjall system and boom right there there's that eruption that starts in July um, and also some activity out here not volcanic though just activity on that end of the uh, out on the end of the peninsula is it related I don't think so um, but who knows right might have been st stress induced perhaps like maybe some stress transfer through the plate boundary that eruption only lasts about uh, a few weeks as well so it's pretty much over at this point so now we're into this past fall September 2023 and you know of course what's coming right so here's September here's October so earthquakes picking up a little bit here but also in other places um, but here's a good end of it. and of course this is going to culminate with that magma intrusion and dike formation um, which produced a, a huge amount of earthquakes. So this is going to go ballistic right there. I just kind of missed it. Um, let's go back just to Skosh. Let's see if I can pause it. So there's November 2nd, November 9th, um, and then there's the 16th. So that, in, in, that includes the November 10th date, and you just can't even see a huge section there. Why are we seeing some of these clusters in other areas? Probably the stress that was transmitted throughout the peninsula from this big intrusive, intrusive event um, triggered a lot of earthquakes in other areas, but they did not necessarily also result in magma accumulating in those areas. So then they die back down. Now we're into December. I guess we sort of missed this goes so quickly. I know you can change the settings and I'm just trying to do it this way just for convenience. So there's November 23rd, December 14th. And of course, this we had a big eruption right after that, uh, December 18th. Uh, let see if I can catch it. Yeah, so that includes the eruption on December 18th. Uh, so very localized there. Uh, and then we turned the new year into January. There was the January 14th eruption, which is back right there. So that includes that. That was the one... Uh, closer to town. That was the lava flows that went into town and took out three homes. Uh, and then finally, oh, we just missed that one again, uh, the last eruption, which was on February 8th. Um, there you go. That might include some of those quakes there. Uh, so pretty interesting. So I don't know. Hopefully I enjoyed that and I appreciate uh, Jan for putting that together. Hopefully that made some sense and maybe further illustrated the point I was trying to make last time. So um, interesting stuff. Okay, let's move on. And let me actually go back to the Met office because um, Amanda Joe texted me and said there was a new, new update up. So let's read this together. I haven't seen this yet. I'm just turning to this for the first time. This was updated just now, basically a few minutes ago. So seismic activity, again, this is with the translate. I'll try is the I don't think the English one's up yet. No, it doesn't look like the English version is up. So we need to go back to the Icelandic version uh, and just let Google Translate try to help us out here. Seismic activity in the, they're saying, metamorphic zone north of Grindavik continues to be mild. So we just looked at that, very few uh, earthquakes. About 20 small earthquakes have been recorded every 24 hours for the past few days. Magma accumulation at Svartsengi continues and the rate has been fairly constant which is very similar to what was seen on the eve of the last eruption. The chain of events that began at the end of October 2023 with the magma intrusion at Svartsengi continues. While the accumulation of magma goes on, new eruptions can be expected in the same areas as before. So they're expecting a repeat of what we've seen the last three eruptions in more or less the same area. Uh, if magma accumulation continues at the same rate as now, the amount of magma will reach the threshold next week that is believed to be needed to trigger the next magma flow and even an eruption. The amount of magma that has accumulated before the previous eruptions began has been between 8 and 13 million cubic meters. New models are being developed to get a clear picture. There's no reason to increase the danger level in the area at the moment, and the danger assessment is therefore unchanged from the last time. So. Yeah, so they're basically saying we've reached that threshold there um, and an eruption is expected soon. So thanks for letting me know, Amanda Joe, that there was a new 
uh, Met Office update. If we look at the GPS data, we'll see the same sort of trend. So here's the Svartsengi power plant GPS station. So upward trend of the data. So the land is rising here in late November uh, because the magma is inflating and causing the land to rise as magma pushes into the subsurface. And then that culminates with the December 18th eruption that drops the land back down. Uh, the land continues to rise as more magma fills into the subsurface. And then that reaches a, a threshold here around the January 14th date. This is one of the questions I want to ask the professor is why on January 14th, at least at this station, because at other stations you see it, but at this station we don't see uh, a down drop. We don't see deflation. We just see more or less there's a little spike here, but otherwise it's just the trend continues. And then we had the February 8th eruption a couple weeks ago. And then since that last eruption, we've seen the GPS data show rise. There's been a few little lulls. You can see a little dip in the data there, but overall the trend is continued inflation. And now we've, maybe we're not quite there, but we're very close to that upper elevation limit prior to February 8th eruption. Uh, so we're pretty much on the cusp or at the threshold of that. So a couple other stations here. Here's the, the new one they put in at the Blue Lagoon. This one shows the trend a little better. Uh, inflation, December 18th eruption, inflation, January 14th eruption, inflation, February 8th eruption, and then now we're pretty much at that threshold there. If you go over to the Eldvrup system, um, you can see the same trend. This one's probably the most graphically, I don't know, the, the pattern looks cleanest here. So you've got the November inflation after the November 10th in, uh, dike intrusion, December 18th, deflation, um, and then, there we go. Uh, then uplift, and then January 14th, uplift, February 8th, uh, and then here we are today at that same point there. So I think the point here with the GPS data and what the Met Office is saying is we're, we're very close to, if not at, that threshold. And so an eruption, if there was an eruption in a day or two, I wouldn't be surprised. If it was within a week or two, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, so we expect something to happen in the next few weeks. If we go another month and nothing's happened, that'll be pretty interesting. But given what we've seen in the past, uh, that's less likely. So, okay, so let's look at some, um, uh, some other news related to the science. Um, and, you know, who knows how long this will actually go. I just saw someone in the live chat say that this will go on for months or years. I'm not ready to say that. It could. Um, it's definitely within the realm of possibility. But a three or four month trend uh, of magma accumulation, I don't think is should be extrapolated out for years or decades. Um, I think we just need to kind of see what happens. I think it's very likely... I think it's more likely it doesn't stay a pattern than it does. Um, nature's oftentimes not that regular. Um, everything's predicated on the rate of magma influx. If magma influx slows down or speeds up, that throws the pattern off. Um, also is predicated on this established conduit system we have from the magma sill, the magma body where it's accumulating and where it's erupting uh, off to the east. With, east. with each eruption, we're changing the plumbing system. We're changing the conduits. And it's likely at some point in one of these eruptions that those plumbing systems get um, drastically changed. Perhaps an eruption takes place in a different area. Um, if it takes place in a different area, it might be able to inflate more. It might fail and produce an eruption at a, at a lower level or, or smaller volume. Just so many different variables there. So uh, I'm not necessarily ready to set my watch by Iceland's eruptions. I know there's other people out there, scientists included, who are looking at this pattern and starting to make long-term predictions. Um, but I'm not. I just I, I think you need more. It's bad statistics, right? We have essentially three data points. We have three eruptions on this graph with the time lag in between each eruption. I'm not ready to predict long-term behavior based on three data points. That's just me though. So we'll see what happens. Um, just 
a point I wanted to make there. So here's a really, I'll make sure this is in the video descriptions. Um, this is a fantastic article uh, written by Quantum Magazine and well worth the time to read. Uh, I'm not sure, let's see, give credit to the author. So Robin George Andrews, well done. This was released just a few days ago on the 20th. And more or less without reading it to you, because it's, you know, it's probably like a 10 minute read. Um, this article does a really nice job of talking about the monitoring efforts in Iceland. And then it sort of summarizes what's taken place over the last three months. And it does so in a very approachable way. There's nothing hugely scientific here. This is written for the general public. And I think it's particularly well written. Uh, great context, great graphics here. Um, some great photos and imagery. Well worth the time to read. Uh, it talks about um, the Met Office's director, uh, Kristen Jonesdalter. Um, yeah, just really well done. But it specifically looks at some of the monitoring efforts that they've had, um, and, you know, and what the future will hold. Nice photos. This is of the. That's I, that's exactly where I was. This was the August 2022 eruption um, that was very tourist friendly. You can see all the people just hanging out on the hillside, eating a sandwich and watching the lava. That was a that was a great, great day there. Uh, some of the cracks in uh, Grindavik. And then they talk a little bit about the connection between uh, Fagradalsfjallt and the, this area near Svartsengi. Just really good article. Read it if you would like to. I'll make sure that the video description is linked. It's linked. The link is in the video description here for you. Um, another article that Amanda Joe sent me from one of the news outlets in an interview with uh, Freisten Sigmundson, hopefully I probably butchered that, the geophysicist. Um, and this talks a little bit about magma maybe moving under Fagradelsfjeld. Again, you know, maybe that's another person I could reach out to and try to do an interview with because um, some of the things said here, I, just, I would just like to ask some clarifying questions about what how we how, how how we know those links exist what is the data that supports uh, some of the the notions and statements he makes here so I'm not disputing anything he says um, he he says there's there are certain indicators these systems are interconnected um, and that is in that in this way volcanic eruptions in Fagradelsfield can relieve the pressure underground in this area uh, I don't dispute that at all. They're right next to each other. I think even some of the geochemistry results, looking at the magmas of both, from both eruptive events, uh, show those similarities. Um, this is an interesting article, so I thought I'd throw that one out there for you as well. Uh, and then Amanda Joe said, please help me out. I have a lot of people asking me. Amanda Joe's become like the, the geology ambassador, the citizen scientist, um, for the Reykjanes Peninsula, which is great. I love it. So she's learned a lot of geology on her own, and now she's sharing that with others. But apparently today in Iceland, because it's sunny but cold, above the lava fields, there's these big billowing clouds, and people who don't know think it might be an eruption. So she's she's had people, and it's it's kind of been out there on social media and other other places that off in the distance people see the billowing clouds and it looks like volcanic gases and they wonder if it's an eruption when in fact what's really happening here is you still have these lava fields that are still emitting heat um, and so on a clear day as that heat rises off the lava field that that hot air comes up off the lava field as that air rises higher that air cools um, and it expands and the water vapor that's present in that air condenses. So as you lower the temperature, you increase the relative humidity. And once you get to 100% humidity, that's the, the temperature or the conditions in which water vapor goes from gas to liquid. So that's when clouds form, when condensation takes place. Uh, and that's essentially what's going on there. So it's nothing volcanic. It's just clouds that are forming. The lava field is such a heat source um, it's heating up that air, um, it's cooling as it rises, and it's basically creating the conditions you see that are similar to um, like a thunderstorm development. Now these aren't thunderstorm clouds per se, but they might have some of the same kind of look to them, big billowy, uh, you know, cumulonimbus looking clouds, um, but they're probably not producing, you know, severe weather or anything like that, but they, from a distance, can look a little bit like that. So, um, yeah, so hopefully that makes sense. And I am, um, 
I do love meteorology. I don't consider myself a, um, you know, professional meteorologist, but I, I am a weather geek. Among other geek pastimes, I dip my toes into, and I love analyzing weather and discussing it. So anyway, um, that explains a little bit of that. But she's had a lot of people in Iceland reaching out to her that aren't sure what they're seeing off in the distance. Um, and so hopefully she wanted me to address that and hopefully put that to bed a little bit. So we could expect that type of behavior above these lava fields anytime you know the weather conditions are like they are today, especially with light winds, uh, clear skies, and relatively cool or cold temperatures. You could expect that for the next, maybe the next few years above some of these lava fields as they slowly cool off and solidify. So, um, okay, next little news item that Amanda Jo sent me, and I didn't quite read the whole thing here, but I thought it was just worth mentioning. Um, evidence of large cavities at three streets. So they're trying to do like a, a full on survey in town. Um, I'm kind of reading this with you at the same time. Yeah, so the colors show the progress of the survey. Red represents areas where the ground survey has not started. And I, I guess that's the this area here. I'd call it kind of an orangey pink, but red, whatever. Yellow color shows where the ground surveying has started and interpretation is in progress. So they're doing a really careful job of surveying the entire uh, Grindavik urban area to get an idea for not just elevations, but actually mapping out all the fractures and cracks, all the, the damage to, in the surface. Um, let's see, anything else here? Crack, cracks have been found during a surface inspection of the port area which need to be inspected with the G deeper geodetic inspection and pit. So they're probably, they're doing a little bit of subsurface um, data acquisition as well to see what's happening just below as best they can. Um, yeah, so they'll, they're putting together a good map of exactly what's happened in town there. So I'll link that one as well in the video description. And last but certainly not least, um, the Blue Lagoon, <laughs> and uh, it's reopened. So as of, uh, that's yesterday, right? No, today, the 22nd. Um, so they've opened up all their operational units, the cafe, the restaurants, the hotels, the spa, it's all there for you to bask in the ambiance of the Blue Lagoon. We recently completed construction on a temporary gravel road segment. Um, so they've basically got reestablish the roadway coming in um, I think from the north and then it'll get paved in the future anyway so there you go so that business is back up and running um, would I stay there overnight probably not um, but what you know if I was into the Blue Lagoon scene would I go there for part of a day sure maybe um, you know if there is an eruption when you're there it'd be a tremendous front row seat the lava may be at the Blue Lagoon quite quickly, so there's a, there's definitely a risk there. But I understand it. It's a big business there, employs a lot of people. Um, so I understand both sides of the coin. You could say that it's silly for them to be reopening, um, but there's people, that this is their livelihood. And so, you know, if we are in some sort of a cyclical pattern with the eruption, maybe there are ways to keep these businesses open for weeks at a time. Uh, and then if we can see signs of an eruption getting closer, maybe we're, we heighten the alert level, maybe a few things kind of shut down, limited access. And then when the eruption happens, obviously things are shut down for a while. It, it just depends on what happens moving forward. So anyway, um, I think that's all I got team. I think that's the end of my update. Uh, I am now going to pull up. Oh, I never even used Google Earth once this time. Well, there you go. There's our Google Earth image. And I'm sure we might use this for some of the, the questions here. So it looks like I've got three pages of questions that Amanda Joe has sent me. Let's go ahead and stop it at three. Uh, I do have another lab to run here in a couple hours and I got some things to get ready, but I can go maybe another 45 minutes or so. So let's see uh, how it goes to run through these questions. Thanks again to Amanda, Joe, and Susan for all their heavy lifting on the live chat and kind of keeping uh, people 
engaged there and keeping everything civil and on task. Okay, so from John from New York, if the lava that came out in the last three months is like putting a lid on the fissures and is solidifying, would the next eruption should be more on the east side? Um, hard to say because, John, the consistency of those those fissures, those vents we saw open up over the last three eruptive cycles, hard to know what their consistency is at depth, right? So we could probably go hike up to the summit of these fissures, um, which would not be a smart idea, by the way. But if we did, we might look into them and decide, hey, that looks solidified to me like that. Maybe it's hot rock, but it's it's solid rock. Um, but what does it look like at depth? What, you know, three kilometers down below that that vent at the surface, um, how solidified is that magma? So there's this spectrum from molten rock to solidified, or yeah, molten rock magma to solidified rock. And in between, we've got things like this crystalline mush. And some of that, you know, when lava gets to a certain viscosity or thickness, that might inhibit the movement of magma moving through it, or it might... Um, allow the magma to move through. So it really depends on some of those things. I, I think that for now, all things being equal, and I think the Met Office agrees, um, that we're more likely to see something here than the magma bypassing this, this dike system it's already established to the surface and then moving somewhere to the east, uh, closer to those older eruptive events. Um, could it move that way eventually over time? Possibly, that's all, I think anything's on the table, um, but I think the most likely event is an eruption in terms of location, something similar to what we saw these last three months. That was what I would say. Um, from Jack McMichael, have you found any pattern in the Icelandic eruptions? Like I talked about, there's just these three, these three events. Um, and if there is a pattern, I guess the pattern is more of a temporal one, like time. And so you can see, these ones show it a little better here. Um, you know, if you count up that number of days and that number of days and that number of days, um, the, you know, it comes out to like 23 to 25 days or so between eruptions. That's maybe the pattern that's emerging. The elevation threshold required to trigger the eruption is changing each time because it's moving up. So <clears throat> back in December, you know, this was the the, the critical elevation that we reached that triggered the eruption, but then that moved up a little bit for the January 14th eruption, and then it moved up quite a bit for the February 8th eruption. Um, so are we going to see the same thing with this next eruption? Does this trend need to keep going up maybe another, you know, tens of millimeters before we see the next eruption? So are there patterns that are emerging here? Sure. Are they patterns that we should be hanging our hat on as like, concrete absolutes probably not but it's an interesting pattern to look at and until we see something going uh, a different way it's, it's a good pattern to maybe just follow and assume but there's lots of assumptions built into those so um okay from klaus schultz is magma from a volcano around the equator more fl fluid than at higher latitudes no magma regardless of latitude um is the same and the fluidity of the magma is going to depend more on the composition of the magma how much silica it has along with some other elements and the temperature of the magma it turns out that when you increase the silica you decrease the overall temperature so the magma becomes l less fluid and more sticky and viscous so good question there from bob your thoughts on the pen Pen penin maybe peninsula being one connected system. I'm assuming, I'm going to guess that's what Bob is asking there. I don't know. That's a question that I want to ask uh, Professor Thorderson. Um, there's these discrete volcanic systems that run through the peninsula, maybe five or six, depending on how you group them. And my light turns off every time I don't move for a while. And um, I don't know. I, I really don't know the answer to that because I, I don't. I don't think they're completely interconnected. I think they're, 
they're part of a tectonic system, um, but are they sharing, they might be sharing magma um, at depth, but as it rises, it's feeding these separate, spatially separate um, volcanic systems. So I'm gonna ask him, I'm not really sure, because um, I've seen arguments kind of for and against a little bit there. From Susan, is there any risk for fluorine poisoning like with Lockheed? Uh, in the Reykjanes Peninsula. Um, I don't know a whole lot of, I mean, I know a little bit about the Lockheed eruption 1783. I don't know much about fluorine poisoning. And if people, I'm assuming, yeah, you'd have to be pretty close. Fluorine is a gas that comes with volcanic eruptions. It's not a dominant gas in terms of composition. Um, you'd have to be really close and downwind. So, to answer your question, I'm going to say no, because of A, we have better sensors and monitoring so we can keep people out of these volcanically, the places where the volcanic gases are dangerous. And two, the Lockheed eruption was huge. It was enormous in terms of the volume of lava that was erupted at the surface. And all of these Reykjanes Peninsula eruptions we've seen have been much, much smaller than that. So, oh, you actually, um, reminded me of another graphic I had that someone shared. I meant to do more with this, so I apologize, but this shows, um, sorry about the side note here. This shows seven eruptions in Iceland and it compares them. So it shows their lava fields. That's what these little outlines are that look like almost like countries or something. Um, and then it shows how many days that the eruption lasted. And then it also shows the volume of lava erupted. So, or an estimate of the lava erupted. So if we go back to this, this is a 2014 eruption uh, in central Iceland, Holukuran, um, that lasted, you know, half a year, six months, 180 days. And just a huge, impressive amount of lava came out of that. It was up in a remote part of Iceland um, uninhabited, didn't impact any structures, but was a very large lava field. Then moving forward in time, we have the 2021 20, to, so uh, March to September of 2021 at the Fagradalsfjall area, east, uh, northeast of uh, Grindavik. That would be this one, so 0.15 cubic kilometers. The next one in 2022 that I visited was this one, Meradalir. Uh, and then the one this past summer, Lidli Kruter, was this one here. And then these are the three more recent ones that we had uh, north of Gudindavik. So this would be the first one in December, December 2018. Um, this, or excuse me, December 18th of 2023. This one was the short-lived January 14th eruption. You can see the little secondary fissure there that was down by where the houses were. And this is the most recent one on February 8th. What I'd meant to do though was, because um, the numbers probably don't mean a whole lot to many of you, I meant to come up with some comparative volumes to give you some context there. And I did, I totally forgot to do that, so I apologize. But a um, little bit of a side note there. Uh, back to the questions from Pete Barlow. Saw some great videos about the amazing Icelanders building a road over the recent lava. How thick will this need to be to avoid breaking through? Uh, oh boy, it depends on how cool the lava is. I, I, I don't know is probably the, the most honest answer, but I would guess that if you've got, you know, let's say it's a three meter thick lava flow and it surprisingly, it doesn't take, you know, if you can get eight to 10 inches, so that would be maybe like 20, 25 centimeters of the upper surface of that flow to have cooled and solidified, that's probably sufficient for you to walk over. And by the time you add some aggregate road-based material, I would guess it's enough for most, you know, regular size vehicles to drive over as well. But I don't know specifically if someone said it was a little bit thicker or thinner than that. Um, yeah, but it cools remarkably, you know, it doesn't take long to have it solid enough that, that, that vehicles or weights it can handle weights on top of it um, remember it's 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 not liquid it's molten rock like you're it, it's dense material so great question there 
Uh, another one from Klaus is magma. Oh, that's the same question. So we answered that. Good deal. Um, from Mar Marjo S. There seems to be this new area of unrest beginning in the Reykjanes Peninsula. When is it safe to say when the peninsula is asleep again? What indications do scientists look at? Well, I think what I was hoping to do was address that with Jan's great animation. Um, and I guess the, the point I'd like to make is that, and just kind of letting this run while I talk, the peninsula is never sleeping. It's an active plate boundary. So it, it hasn't been asleep ever, <laughs> right? Like. It might be asleep, if that's the right word. It might be quiet for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, but the earthquake activity continues. There's stress building up in the subsurface. It's on a tectonic boundary. And occasionally, like we're having now, that culminates in not just tectonic activity and earthquakes, but also volcanic activity. Um, so asking when is it, is, you know, is it safe to say, I don't, until we see earthquakes drop way down across the peninsula and vol volcanism completely stop. Um, I, I don't think it'll happen anytime soon. It, it is the plate boundary for now. Um, and it's probably going to be centuries, maybe thousands of years, um, if the plate boundary shifts to some other location before uh, the Reykjanes is you know, tectonically less active and vol volcanically as well. Uh, David Chapman, what are the indicators of being a freshwater lake? Oh, you were discussing your trip to Bryce Canyon. Thanks for the context there. Um, I don't know. I w actually, when I was down there with my friend, um, he's like, are there fossils in this rock? And I'm like, there could and should be because the Eocene was very warm 50 million years ago. Freshwater lake, like it makes sense that there would be snails and maybe other organisms in it. But I hadn't... I have, I've never seen any fossils in that lake and um, I've never heard of any, but I haven't looked at the literature in a, in a deep way. So my, my guess would be, we know it's a freshwater lake. One, because there, prob there could be fossils that indicate that. I also think, and I'm no expert on this, but I think the type of limestone and the type of calcium carbonate that forms that limestone in a freshwater system versus a marine system, I think they, they have some differences in the chemistry, and so that might be an indicator. And then thirdly, we can reconstruct the geography of the western U.S. at the time those rocks formed at Bryce Canyon, and we can see that that area around Bryce Canyon was not connected to the ocean. So it was landlocked, and so it would have to be a lake system. And so freshwater limestones aren't that uh, uncommon. So, okay, there's... Uh, there's question set number one from Amanda Joe. Let me pull up the second one. Thanks for putting these together, Amanda Joe. And I like having them words nice because then I can just show them and people can see them uh, as we work through them together. Um, Sean, for those not from the U.S., what are hoodoos? Oh, that's that's a great question. Um, so hoodoos are the name. And maybe it's a U.S. term, I don't know, but the name we give to these uh, pinnacles of rock, the narrow pinnacles of rock, how narrow is narrow, you know, anything from, uh, you know, chimney size or maybe a little bit bigger to that and smaller. So a narrow pinnacle of rock is sometimes called a hoodoo, um, kind of a funny name. It might be totally an American thing, um, but other synonyms for a hoodoo would be spire, pinnacle, Usually if it's more elongated, like if these were all connected here, sometimes we might call that a fin. So there's some other names that are quite similar. So good question. And thanks for helping me clarify that. Uh, from Paul P, uh, related to Grindavik. Do I understand it correctly? The road affected by the last eruption is somehow patched and open to traffic with material stacked over the lava. Yeah, that's my understanding. They, But it's, it's, it's just certain roadways, not all the roadways that were covered from the eruption and maybe Amanda Jo answered your question in the live chat a while ago because um, she certainly would know better than I would so um, yeah so they have actually even though it's only been a few weeks covered some of that um, covered the lava flow with road base so that cars can go across it getting that infrastructure back and patched together 
um, from Phil A. Berm seems to be effective in diverting lava flows in Iceland. Have berms ever been used elsewhere, and in particular the Big Island, and if not, why? Okay, good question. Um, and I'll handle this as best I can. So specifically, he's talking about Hawaii. So let's head that way and look at the Big Island. Let's throw um, throw the major volcanoes up there. Let's take out some of this other stuff that we don't necessarily need. We don't need some of this stuff at all. Um, and let's take out the rift zones. Okay, so five big volcanoes there. Um, to my knowledge, they've never really done this in Hawaii, except for with some of the eruptions off Mauna Loa in the maybe 60s, 70s, maybe it was older than that. They did try um, bombing them with, for a while using military like bombs from aircraft um, to help divert the flow. But in terms of constructing a berm, I don't think that's ever happened in Hawaii. The biggest impediment, I would say, we just saw how effective they, you know, they, they can be somewhat effective in, in, in Iceland. Um, but it uh, partially depends on the volume of lava. If you have just a tremendous eruption, like some of these Mount Aloha eruptions have just been massive in terms of the amount of lava they have poured out uh, and gone downhill. It might be a tricky battle to kind of fight large volume lava flows with these berms. The bigger issue, I think, in Hawaii is probably more of a cultural one. Um, the Hawaiian, native Hawaiian mythology is very much tied to the land. Uh, there's the goddess Pele, which is the, 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 the controls the volcanoes uh, in their belief system. And to them, the land is very sacred. And I don't think they would approve collectively as a body. Some individuals might, might approve of it. But collectively as a culture, um, if you said, hey, there might be an eruption and we want to like dig up the land with a trench and put up a big berm, um, there'd be some pushback on that undoubtedly because they believe that they live at, as one with the land and when the lava erupts from these volcanoes, that's where it's supposed to go and that's kind of the will of these deities. And so um, I think that's the bigger issue is the 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 cultural sensitivity would be a big impediment. I certainly want to, wouldn't want to show up in Hawaii and say, hey team, what we're going to do the next time Kilauea erupts is we're going to dig up, you know, five kilometers, three miles of the ground, make a big ridge of material, and we're going to divert the lava flow around houses or whatever. Um, some people might be on board with that, but I'm pretty sure among some of the more culturally sensitive natives that would not go over really well. So I think that's some of the bigger uh, bigger impediments there. So interesting question for sure. Uh, from Sarah B, is it possible for these Fartsang eruptions to become more explosive if building pressure became high enough as opposed to fluid eruptions? Not if they stay on land. The only, the, the magma composition is is a very runny type of lava. It is a low silica high temperature fluid type of an eruption and so or type of uh, magma so when we have eruptions here if we build up more quote unquote pressure that would we might get um, fountains of lava that go higher but when you say explosive when I think of explosive in terms of volcanic eruptions I think of lava being literally exploded to the point that it makes fine ash that's what we call an explosive eruption so there's really no chance of these eruptions becoming ash producing eruptions explosive eruptions that produce pyroclastic flows and ash fall and some of the more dangerous volcanic conditions uh, because of the magma composition. It's erupting this fluid type of material. It's basaltic magma. Um, the only way we can get something that produces ash is if we get this magma interacting with water. And we saw a little phase of that on that February 8th eruption where some of that magma interacted with some groundwater. And we watched it during one of my live streams. We watched this plume of vigorous uh, uh, water vapor 
and ash come out of the vent there that was probably locally explosive but in terms of like hazardously explosive excuse me over an area um, not very likely because of the magma composition uh, from Gail Vaught is there a time when you go on vacation and just not do geology um, no well I mean I feel really lucky and fortunate that I found a career and a pathway that not only like feeds the family and earns an income but is just what I love to do so well I'll give you an example so I am going on a vacation in March in a month uh, we're going to Prague and Vienna my wife and I and two other couples um, we got a good deal on the travel thing I'm not a big city person um, there won't be a lot of rocks to see there and that's fine so I am I'm, I'm fine doing that but if I get to pick the vacation and I get to choose the location there's usually landscapes and cool geology to see my bucket list of places to go very much reflects my interest in geology um, but you know I like going to the beach and just surfing and hanging out and doing fun things my recreational activities are very outdoor oriented and you know as a geologist I'm always kind of looking for cool geologic features or processes but I can just relax and recreate too whether it's a river trip or going rock climbing or mountain biking or whatever so um, but if I can combine the two that's the best so combining vacations recreations and geology all together um, makes sense and that's why these YouTube videos initially and still were pretty easy to do because we were already going to these outdoor places and I thought well I could just like you know take an extra 10 minutes and do a video and share this geology and this experience and this location with the general public and maybe share it with people who will never be able to come here or people who didn't know this existed and for me that's the real joy uh, in making those videos for for you good folks is to be able to share and and take you there right you're, you're not there but but I'm there and then I can share that with you and that's maybe the next best thing to you being there uh, with me so um, hopefully a decent answer there Gail Peter uh, the volcano Hengil seems to have a bunch of activity on the western flank for the past couple days um, can you take a look at this um, I haven't looked at that in a lot of detail the Hengil volcano now we got to go back across the ocean um, let me just click on that is further to the northeast right um, so let's maybe find it exactly just quickly by the other power plant isn't it yeah it's kind of in this area here so here's let me throw the labels up so here's the capital um, there's a power plant right in here somewhere as you go over the pass yeah right around here there it is power plant there um, and I can't remember all the names of all these volcanic systems as you get further away f up uh, from the peninsula my Iceland geology starts to, to wane a little bit but this is um, like this is Thingvellir this is part of the national park just up here um, so I haven't looked at that I'll have to check that when you say a bunch of activity I don't know if that's, you know, 20 earthquakes, 20 earthquakes in a day, interesting. 200 earthquakes in a day, really interesting, right? Um, and the GPS stations, I'll have to look at that. Uh, Gail, how does the sandstone in the West compare to sandstone in my state of Georgia? Well, having never been to Georgia, I don't have a good knowledge about your sandstone. I would guess in general, the sandstone in the west is younger than the sandstone in your state. The sandstone in the west, for the most part, hasn't been as well compacted. And so in some places it's a little more grainy or crumbly. But some sandstone is very well indurated or, or cemented together. Sandstone in Georgia and the southern part of the Appalachians has seen a lot more um, compression, burial, and so it's therefore much better cemented together. So, yeah, hopefully that helps. Tony, uh, is there an example of any volcanic activity happening in the U.S. in the near future? 
is an event overdue, for example? Well, I think the most likely place for us to see an eruption really soon would be Hawaii, of course, and Alaska. Those are probably our two most volcanically active regions, those two states. Um, in the continental US, um, the Cascades um, are uh, as a system we monitor. So the USGS monitors the all the Cascade volcanoes, those big huge strata volcanoes like Mount St. Helens. Uh, they look at the earthquakes, the, the ground deformation with GPS and other tools. They look at gas concentrations coming out of them. So those are very well monitored. Uh, and none of them are showing signs, elevated signs of activity right now. Um, there's also another volcano observatory in California around uh, the Long Valley caldera on the east side of the Sierras near Mammoth. And then there's Yellowstone. So there's, uh, that's also monitored as well. When you say overdue, that's not, nature doesn't work that way. Volcanoes don't set their clock by time. The overdue term is when you often hear with Yellowstone because you look at there was an eruption about 2.1 million years ago, one that was 1.3 million years ago, and one that was about 640,000 years ago. And if you look at the time difference between those eruptions, it averages out to like 700,000 years. And so you could say, well, the last eruption was 640,000 years ago, but we're supposed to get one, you know, every however many years. So therefore, you know, we're overdue. You can play those games, but that's bad statistics. Three events, you know, I don't want to come up with long-term trends um, based on three statistics there. So overdue is just kind of like a, a, a dangerous word to use in science. I know the press picks it up and the public uses it. Um, I certainly wouldn't use it. So, so Hawaii and Alaska would be the most likely places. If you said there's gonna be an eruption in the US in the next month, and I had to guess where it's gonna be, those are the two places I'm picking right off the bat. Uh, if you said continental U.S. and I had to pick, I guess I'd pick a Cascades volcano, but I don't know which one. Maybe St. Helens, maybe South Sister near Bend. Yeah. Um, Pamela, have watched some of your videos about unconformities, but what exactly is a nonconformity? Uh, yeah, this came up. I, I'm planning to do a whole series. I think what I'd like to do, and maybe you can let me know if this is a good idea, Every day in my classes, you know, we have like a lecture or we learn things and I can just take those um, and do them in front of the computer here with you and then put those up on my YouTube channel. So I would like to eventually, and I think I'll start doing it this summer, if not sooner, putting together my whole geology 101, physical geology, quote unquote, lectures, which would include things like unconformities um, and then putting those out there. And so then you could kind of digest those over time. So there'd be, you know, maybe a couple different little 40 minute videos on plate tectonics and there'd be one on unconformities. To answer your question though, an unconformity in general is a erosional surface. So whenever we have rocks that were laid down and then were eroded and then other rocks were laid on top of them, that surface is an unconformity. So you can think of an unconformity as being two things, an erosional surface, but also the, but also a record that we're missing some period of time. We're missing rocks that record a certain time interval. The analogy I like to use is it's like taking a book and then a few pages or chapters have been ripped out of the book. You don't have a record at that location of what took place at that time. One specific type of unconformity is a nonconformity where the rocks below the unconformity are either igneous or metamorphic. So imagine like granite, right? So granite is magma that intrudes and solidifies into rock to form granite. That granite gets uplifted to the surface. It gets eroded partially, right? So we've stripped away some of the granite. Um, and then on top of that erosional surface, we deposit some other sedimentary rock like sandstone. That surface between the granite and the sandstone would be a nonconformity because the rocks beneath the unconformity are not sedimentary they're igneous or metamorphic. That's what makes it a nonconformity. Uh, and then there's two other types, angular unconformities and disconformities. There's actually another one I did a video about called a buttress unconformity, but that's kind of a more rare type as well. Um, but I'll do a video on those soon. That's, that's great, uh, good incentive right there. 
Uh, William, this goes back to the Bryce Canyon stuff. When were those lakes formed? And from what, glacial melt? No, the climate in the Eocene was just very wet. So I've done videos in central Idaho on the Eocene, and we have these amazing, huge, one to two meter across uh, stumps of fossilized wood, petrified wood from sequoias. So sequoias, which are relatives of redwoods, living in central Idaho in what is now a very dry um, kind of high altitude location is pretty, pretty incredible. And so it was a very wet, temperate period in the Western United States at that time. So not really glacial melt. In fact, Eocene did not even have, there were really hardly, there weren't even any glaciers in the mountains, maybe the highest mountains, but uh, in the Intermountain West, the Eocene was a very warm time period. So not glacial melt, um, just a, a wetter climate. And so you had more rainfall and uh, a wetter system. Okay, that's uh, page two. If you're still with me, and I hope you are. Yeah, Malm Gulch. Thank you, Marin. Um, I'm going to go to page three here, and then we'll, so this will be our last round of questions. If Amanda Joes put together some other ones, she can send me those for another time. Um, okay, so David Miller, if Iceland has an underwater eruption, is it possible to show evidence at the surface? If so, how would we know? Um, I am assuming he's talking about like something offshore. So if we get an eruption way out here, um, it sort of depends on the depth and I don't have a firm number here, but if we're like way out here and it's under, I got this in feet, but you could transfer it to meters if you want to. If it's under like 500 feet of ocean water, seawater, um, we're probably not going to see anything at the surface. But if that eruption continues, right, so what would happen is the, the magma will come up um, to the ocean floor. It will erupt as lava. Uh, but there's so much pressure of the overlying ocean above it that that keeps it from uh, erupting explosively. So that lava comes up, it gets cooled quickly with the with the water there, but there's too much water pressure sitting on top of it for it to um, become explosive. So what happens is you get these rounded pillow lavas. I've done videos on these in the past uh, that would just accumulate on the seafloor. So you're building up a, a, a vent of pillow lavas on the seafloor. If that eruption keeps continuing, and that pile of volcanic pillow lavas and material builds up towards the surface and now there's less water sitting on top of it. At some point, maybe when you're looking at a few hundred feet of water, maybe a hundred meters or so, you can get to a point where now there's not so much water sitting on top of it and the gases um, and the heat of the lava interacting with the water can flash to steam and that can create explosive conditions. And so you can get something like we saw uh, off the coast of Iceland in 1963 with, with Surt Sea. Um, and so I don't have good firm numbers there, but that's sort of the idea with how that might progress. So how would we know it has erupted? We might not. We might see the earthquake activity tick up and that could either be magma moving close to the surface. If we see the earthquakes getting shallower and some of those earthquake depths are essentially on the seafloor, uh, that might mean that an eruption is possible, but we wouldn't really have it confirmed unless we could get some observations. Maybe a submersible can go down there, or some, or maybe we see some of the ocean gets discolored because there's volcanic material erupting, and that's kind of you know discoloring the water a little bit. Those would be my my best guesses there. Uh, from Hans Heinrich Olsen, since your field trip in Iceland is booked full, can you recommend local Icelandic tours? with reputable local geologists. It seems everyone with a YouTube account are currently experts. Um, great question. And I don't, I'm not super dialed in. Um, Amanda Joe was the first geologist I quote unquote met and we haven't even met in person. We just have gotten to know each other well with uh, texts and emails over the last couple months. Um, I guess I'll meet uh, Professor Thorsen uh, tomorrow. That'll be exciting. And then I've come to know Johan who lives in Iceland and is our drone pilot through Nature Eye. Um, so I don't know any Icelandic tours. I, I don't know any Icelandic tours where you're going to be guided by an actual geologist. There might be some that exist. Um, and there's a few American geologists I know that do those, but I don't know them well enough to say if I would like give them 
my thumbs up and gold star. So, so I can't be more helpful there, but uh, those are some ideas. There are a lot of tour companies that either say that they'll interpret the geology or that involve a geologist. And I'm not saying I'm the most, I am not, I always say that just right now, proud and strong. I am not a full Icelandic geology expert. I'm just learning what I can and sharing that with you. I'm eager to learn more. I would love to latch on to an Iceland geologist that knows more than I do and follow them around and learn from them. So, um, yeah, maybe if you find some tours and you want to send them to me, I can at least do a little bit of sleuthing and let you know if it's, you know, how, how reputable it is there. That might be helpful. Uh, from Paul, given the data we have, un have until today, how you show, assess the probability of a new eruption mid and March, like the one month averaging between eruptions. Yeah, I think based on what we've seen these last three eruption, erupted periods, that that's as good a place as any to start with. Um, I'm not ready to make a prediction and say it's going to happen on this day, but in terms of forecasting a two week window where there's a 60 or whatever percent chance of an eruption seems pretty reasonable based on GPS data and things we've seen before. We might be able to get a short term uh, eruptive forecast out if we see earthquake trends, like if the earthquakes are accumulating, that might give us anywhere from 20 minutes uh, warning to maybe a couple hours. Um, that's possible. So, uh, so Mao Moon Doggy, did you see the charts I sent you? Oh, um, yeah, I have. I have a ton of email that I have not been able to get all the way through. So if this is um, from Bruce, um, yeah, I think I have. I have the email. I just haven't looked at it. So I'll try to look at that. I apologize. From David, you may have already answered this question, but can a seismologist look at a seismometer and tell what kind of earthquake is happening? Absolutely. Uh, I'm not that person. I'm not a, a trained seismologist, but seis trained seismologists can look at the seismic signal from an event and tell you if that's um, a big truck rolled by with some construction equipment, it was a landslide, it was a tectonic quake, it was possibly... Now, the difference is tectonic quake versus magma breaking rock at depth. Sometimes those can look very similar, um, but they can distinguish between a lot of different things that can look like, that can be be registered as a quote unquote earthquake. So they can differentiate those. Certainly when we get to magma that's close to erupting or near the surface and we get things like harmonic tremor involved, um, those can definitely be differentiated. They have different waveforms and different frequencies of behavior. Uh, from Jeffrey Porter, how much time has to pass between an aftershock and the next seismic event to be considered a quake and not an aftershock? Ah, the age-old question, Jeffrey Porter. Um, to my knowledge, the seismologists haven't determined a good, solid definition of those, so I'll just give you my best take on that. Um, generally, we have an, a seismic event. Um, let's say it's a magnitude 6 and then we get a bunch of earthquakes near that location, let's say within, I don't know, 100 kilometers or so, and they come after it. So those earthquakes that are nearby after that magnitude six earthquake would be considered aftershocks. Um, but at what point, now, now let's say we have uh, a magnitude, so let's say two months go by and there's still little earthquakes happening, and now there's a magnitude 6.7 that new bigger quake is now classified as its own separate event and all the earthquakes after it would be aftershocks and now it's kind of getting muddy because some of those aftershocks might be from the first event and also the second one but basically the next seismic event needs to be larger than the main event to be considered its own separate earthquake if that made any sense at all awesome if i just confused you further then i apologize uh, from Joe Carter, how old is this hotspot and how much do we know about how they occur or what drives them? Sorry, I can't stay, got to go to work. All right, thanks, Joe. Uh, maybe you'll catch us on the replay. Thanks for your question. Um, the Icelandic hotspot is, <clears throat> I'd have to look it up, at least 60 or so million years old. Actually, do I have a graphic that shows that? 
I might. Um, uh, I don't know if I can find it in time, so I'll just I'll just wing it here. Um, I think it's about 60 million years old. In this particular case, the Hawaiian hotspot is 150, 60, 160, something like that, million years old. Um, do we know how they occur and what drives them? Not exactly. We've got some ideas, we've got some models, but hotspots remain largely the subject of a lot of research. They're way the heck down there. We don't exactly know where they originate. Is it the outer core? Is it parts of the deeper mantle? Um, they're just these anomalously hot zones of melted rock that wells up and comes to the surface. So lots of unknowns there. But you could probably do a deep dive on the internet on hotspots and, and find some other stuff out there as well. Um, Greetings, Professor. It seems after the eruptions, at least at the power plant GPS station, inflation begins at a higher level. Do you notice this? Yeah, I think um, I think we did look at that, right? So, yeah. So when it when we have the eruptive event, the deflation doesn't take it all the way back down to the starting point. It's at a higher point. So we're not erupting all the magma. We're just erupting some of the magma from the system, the er, what we could call the eruptible magma, the, the magma that's overpressurized, um, that's worked its way into the dike system, um, and that's ready to go. Just like when a geyser erupts, it doesn't erupt all the water, it just erupts the superheated water near the top of the system. That's what blows out of the geyser um, and forms that impressive um, thing you see there. Similarly, in these eruptions, we're just erupting portion of the of the full magma reservoir that exists in the subsurface um, okay two more team and then uh, we'll wrap this up from Nigel Rogers can you talk about the mantle plume what is known about it is it the mantle plume that's directly linked to the 800 year activity cycle um, I'm not sure and these are questions I want to ask uh, Professor Thorderson tomorrow about how much of the magmatism on the Reykjanes Peninsula is attributed to tectonics because we have a divergent plate boundary, we have decompression melting, we have, a, we have a system and a process to generate magma and how much might be related to the hotspot because the Icelandic hotspot is hundreds of kilometers to the east uh, underneath the big uh, Vatnat Yoko ice cap, the big glacier there. That's where the hotspot is but could there be little feeders coming off of that to the west that feed into the Reykjanes Peninsula. I, I don't know. So, um, And in terms of 800 year activity cycle, again, if you look at, um, I think it's a limited data set. So if we look at, let me pull this up here. Um, what have I got here? Here we go. If we look at the eruptive history on the peninsula. So here's different volcanic systems across the Reykjanes Peninsula. The yellow bars were a volcanic episode. So you're right that on average in between volcanic episodes it's you know 800 to 1000 or so years on average depending on which one you go with. But it's still short statistics. We only have in any given volcanic system we only have one, two, three volcanic episodes, volcanic uh, periods. Um, what did it look like for the thousands of years before that? And so can you take the last three patterns and project indefinitely into the future? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Um, you know, it's, it's the best thing we, we have to go on, though. So we don't have the data that precedes this, um, which would be nice. So lots of unknowns here in terms of uh, what this might look like. So I don't know if I answered your question or not, but I tried. Kate, last question. It would be great if you could interview a geophysics expert. It would be nice to try and get a handle on how they read the details in the seismic data. I agree. Ge uh, that would be awesome. Um, if you know someone, Kate, that you could set me up with, that would be great. Um, I guess there's some folks I could try and email. I suppose the one of the good things about this YouTube thing getting bigger is perhaps it gives me a little bit more clout um, and recognition. So instead of just Sean Wilsey from Twin Falls, Idaho at a small college, 
um, it's like oh he's the YouTube guy and um, and so yeah like if I'm talking to him I'm talking to a larger audience versus just he and I talking so yeah I'll try to do that that would be a great idea um, hopefully this was helpful here team uh, make sure I don't have any last minute things uh, oh there's a so there is a question sheet for that Amanda Joe sent me but unfortunately um, duty calls for me and I have a historical geology lab that I need to do a little bit of prep work on and get ready for that starts in a little over an hour so I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this up please make sure you like the live stream feel free to share it with folks it's great to see our numbers increase it's great to see we've established such a great community here um, I want to thank Amanda Joe and Susan Helmer for their awesome work in manning the live chat they do this just because they love what we're doing here they're not asking for anything in return um, and so I really appreciate them volunteering their time um, oh real last quick question here when you get an Amanda Joe question you have to answer it right yeah she wants to know why don't we have data that precedes the last three eruptive cycles is it not available because we can't get to it or it's just not there okay great question so going back to this graph graphic here um, our data for the last eruptive cycles comes from no I'm gonna answer it, Amanda Joe of course I always take time for you um, it's the exposed rock so great question how do we how do we know there was an eruption you know a little over 3,000 years ago out on the tip of the peninsula and how do we know there was an eruption uh, in the Krishivik system at around 2,000 years ago the data the repository the resource that we have are the rocks right so we have ash tephra lava flows um, anything that came out of that volcano during that eruptive period fell onto the ground that material can be dated so we can get a date a radiometric date of when the event occurred um, if there were several eruptive episodes we can get a date you know maybe one date's here and one date's there and they and it looks like there were more dates in between so that allows you to establish a period so these yellow bars on this graphic here are volcanic episodes that doesn't mean it was erupting continuously from 3,500 years ago to almost 3,000 years ago like oh another day with a volcano erupting no it's probably kind of like what we see today like in the future people will look back possibly on today you could look back at today and be like or today's in terms of like the most recent volcanic eruptions we've had six eruptions in the last three years right not even three years um, but geologically it'll look like one episode potentially so we can't go back further because those rocks aren't exposed we either haven't drilled down far enough to tap into those rocks or they're just not exposed this part of Iceland is a very young landscape uh, what would be great is if a big river was over here and had cut a huge canyon and then we could see the layers and we could access those rocks and get their ages and calculate the volumes um, but that doesn't exist we have this very young landscape just a few thousand years old and we've been able to access lava flows tephra layers ash layers um, of different ages piece that story together and that's the best we have right now undoubtedly the Reykjanes volcanic history goes back much further but this is all we have is the most recent 35 or so uh, hundred years of history so yeah great question Amanda Joe. she's uh, she's she's taking over for me I tell you she's she's learning this stuff quickly by leaps and bounds and pretty soon uh, it'll be her running the show and and I'll just and I'll be happy to hand off the reins to her because she's she's doing great so uh, hopefully that was helpful hopefully you guys are um, learning along with me I hope I've been able to provide some uh, perspective some education here as well uh, thanks to all who have been able to come on today and share with us and spend time with us uh, Skagit Ed thanks for your donation very helpful um, the, I'll make sure I put links on the video description um, there's also a link there if you feel compelled to assist Amanda Jo with her housing situation and some of the crazy life turmoil she's had as she's been displaced from uh, Glindavik uh, 
her PayPal link is on there as well. Uh, but just being here is enough. Just being engaged and participating is plenty. Uh, watching the videos is obviously helpful. Anything you can do just to promote our community is always much appreciated. So I think I'm ready to about sign off. If you have any questions, um, let me know. Otherwise, we will... What will we do next? Um, I'll talk to Professor Thordorsen tomorrow and I'll get that interview up hopefully tomorrow afternoon. Uh, I'll probably put one of the Bryce Canyon videos up for this weekend. So maybe on Saturday or Sunday you can look for that. And then next week, can we do another live stream next week? We can't do it on Thursday because I have labs. But we maybe could do one Hmm, next week looks kind of busy. Of course, next week we could have an eruption, right? So we'll have to kind of see. I'll keep you posted. Um, yeah, my schedule is a little busy next week. Next weekend it might be a little more open. We'll have to see. So thanks again, friends, for all you're doing. Thanks for all that were here to participate, uh, especially our moderators. And we'll see you soon. Signing off from sunny... Oh yeah, the sun's out, a couple high clouds, that kid's in a t-shirt, yep, college students are in t-shirts, so it's got to be a nice day already, so I got my field trip later today, so that's going to be good. Um, yeah, we'll go ahead and sign off, I'll make sure I read through the live chat comments later, uh, if there's anything I can address, I'll try to do that. I do read all your comments on YouTube. I don't necessarily respond to all of them, but I do read them and try to respond as best I can. Trying to keep up with the emails and the comments and such as, as this thing kind of just slowly balloons and, and grows, which is a good thing. But doing my best here, team. Hope you're well. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much.